in five, four, three, two, one. When it comes to COVID-19, there's a lot of misinformation out there. So next on the Jeff Curley Show, we're going to be talking to two experts. One of them just testified before a Senate subcommittee. That's just ahead. Many are predicting that the worst is yet to come, which is unfortunate, said one person here. Until now, they've enjoyed the reputation of being the nation's icebox. Watched a burglar in his home this morning by webcam. As a journalist of over 25 years, stories are what make my world turn. Reporting live from the Dallas Newsroom tonight, Jeff Crilly, Fox 4 News. But in 2008, I took the jump from my familiar life and started a PR firm from my home. We're talking about anyone with a camcorder like the one I'm using becomes a television network. We started slowly growing the company and we now have over a hundred clients and we've branched into the world of live digital broadcasting. I now own eight different TV studios and have a huge team. And the stories that I now get to share are sometimes the most important of my life. Life has a funny way of coming around full circle. This is The Jeff Crilly Show. Boy, 2020 has been a very, very long year. Can't wait for 2021. Uh, we've been hearing uh, nonstop about COVID, and there's been a lot of information and misinformation out there, too. To sort out facts from fiction now, uh, two uh, leading experts, Dr. Peter McCullough. He's an internist and cardiologist here in Dallas, and, and Dr. Al Johnson, a good friend and client of Real News PR, doctor of internal medicine. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks, You're welcome. welcome. All right, uh, Peter, we're going to start with you. Uh, you testified, and we're going to show a clip here in a, in a few minutes. Tell us how what led up to this testimony. Well, it's certainly uh, important to understand that uh, COVID-19 is what we consider a once-in-a-100-year pandemic. It's the worst medical disaster of all time. I think everyone would agree. And I've developed a concern over the course of the pandemic that we're missing a tremendous opportunity to treat this illness early and prevent hospitalizations and death. And so I was called to testify on, on how all this came together. And Dr. Johnson, you and I have known each other for a decade now. Are you treating a lot of patients for COVID-19? I see quite a few. It, as Dr. McCullough was saying, this is the only time in medicine history that I know of, I've been around for 45 years, that early treatment has not been forced or really made known out there on how doctors should treat a disease process early on, whether it's a bacterial infection, the flu, or appendicitis. Early treatment has always better outcomes. And uh, I, I was very impressed with the, uh, f you got five minutes before a Senate subcommittee, and I, I'm so com uh, convinced that this message is important that we're going to run the whole five minutes. So let's go ahead and watch that now. Specialized in the treatment of patients with complicated internal medical problems and have major, affected major organs, including the heart and kidneys. Dr. McCullough. Thank you, Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Peter, and members of the committee for allowing me uh, to talk to you today about the critical need for early ambulatory treatment for COVID-19 as an emergency measure in the middle of this national crisis. As we sit here today, uh, we have a, the greatest mass of infected Americans uh, that we've ever had since the start of the pandemic and Americans are pouring into hospitals untreated, the hospital census is already at, at capacity. A national calamity of unimaginable mortality is right around the corner. In a matter of weeks, weeks to months, Americans are going to be horrified with what they see on the news with respect to a hospital overrun, uh, mortality skyrocketing for both COVID and non-COVID uh, complications and conditions and, uh, and patients uh, further infecting other Americans as this pandemic spirals out of control. My viewpoint uh, and my views expressed here are those of my own and not necessarily my institutions. My viewpoint is this pandemic should have always been viewed as having four pillars, if we can bring up the figure. The first pillar is contagion control. We have had probably the vast majority of government efforts solely focused on contagion control. The entire media representation of what the government has been doing has been on contagion control. Well, we, as we see it here today, it's obvious contagion control has not solved the problem. The second pillar is early ambulatory treatment. This virus 
uh, infects individuals and they sit at home for two weeks. We have a two week opportunity to treat this problem and we hear nothing about it. We hear nothing about early ambulatory treatment. There's no updates. There's no viewpoint to Americans of what's going on outside of the United States where early ambulatory treatment is a standard of care in countries that are doing much better than the United States. It's grossly overlooked. The third pillar is the hospitals, and I've already told you, they're overrun. We're doing all the best technologies we possibly can in the hospital, but the hospital's an inadequate safety net. The current hospital mortality rate's about 5 to 7 percent. When patients get in the ICU, it's 25 percent, and virtually all the COVID deaths that occur, occur in the hospital. It's obviously not a, an adequate safety net for Americans. The fourth pillar is vaccination. Vaccination should bring out the close to the pandemic, but this hearing is about early ambulatory treatment. We can bring up the next figure. We've learned a lot about the virus. There have been over 75,000 peer-reviewed publications in PubMed since the onset of the pandemic. Information is flowing in at about 500 papers a day. So any expert who claims that a review of data and studies is contemporary, they're quickly out of date. And I can tell you with this pandemic uh, and this virus, what we've learned is that there's an early viral replication phase uh, followed by a destructive immune activation called cytokine storm and then blood clotting thrombosis. And what doctors have done is they've innovated and they've uh, uh, identified both in the hospital and outside of the hospital, aided by clinical trials and observational studies, an approach that involves combination antivirals followed by corticosteroids and antithrombotic agents. Doctors in the outpatient uh, communities faced with thousands of patients calling and begging for help have innovated. Dr. Zelenko is one in New York in the middle of the uh, calamity in New York who was a, a, a early innovator. I summarized uh, these and published them in the American Journal of Medicine, uh, uh, the synthesis of the principles of randomized trials and observational studies. Uh, and this uh, uh, algorithm has been updated multiple times uh, and it provides a framework for new drugs and agents to be incorporated in an early ambulatory treatment approach. I've reviewed every report from real world data from American doctors who have innovated and faced this problem. And I can tell you that they are achieving rates of hospitalization and death less than 3% for high risk Americans over 50 with multiple conditions. Most doctors can achieve less than 1%. With no treatment in the United States right now, an individual over 50 with medical problems faces a 7% rate of hospitalization and death. Some in their 80s, that skyrockets to 40%. I can tell you as a doctor, I have always treated high-risk patients with the best tools available. And I looked at all the evidence. When it was obvious that AIDS drugs didn't work, I didn't use them, but hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, if I had favipiravir, I'd combine it with other drugs, and then steroids. That should be non-controversial. Doctors should be using corticosteroids in patients. What doctor would not help a patient who's at risk for a catastrophic stroke that occurs as a complication of this condition? So I can tell you right now, I'm not asking for permission to do this, but I'm asking for your help. I'm asking for the government to organize all government agencies that are related to this to assist doctors rapidly with their innovation and their compassionate care of patients with COVID-19 at home because we can present, prevent hospitalization and death. And right now, it's the only option on the table. Thank you. I am so impressed, and you're so passionate about it. I mean, what came to my mind was Paul Revere, just kind of like, "Hey, guys, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta wake up." Uh, how was it received? Well, I think it was well received across the country. I am disappointed on what we perceive as is really a, a a blanking of the major media on this. Uh, you know, if you turn on any major news station, you never hear an update about what can be done at home to treat COVID-19. Patients are kept in the dark. They're given a test result and told to go home and then wait if they get sick enough to go to the hospital. And we can do way better than that. Um, Dr. Johnson, let's bring you back into the conversation. I keep hearing a lot of uh, good things about vitamin D and zinc and these things. Are these things that we should all be taking uh, preventatively? Yes, most definitely. They all they help with the immune system. They support the body's functions, uh, and it's a protective device. So exactly, the vitamin D, the zinc. Uh, I added in some lysine in my patients as that helps with decreased viral replication. So. Very important, I think you do that with all your patients and then when necessary, you add in the prescription drug items. And are you finding that some people are confused? I mean, do they know the difference instantly between a seasonal flu and uh, COVID-19? Well, I personally had it 
and um, I can tell you it's a little different than a cold. Usually a cold leads with a sore throat for several days and then it blossoms into everything else. This one is pretty minor, sore throat, almost some back of the throat dryness, uh, and then nasal stuffiness, and then the fever sets in. And so the scary part of COVID-19, I had it myself, is when it progresses into the lungs. And when the shortness of breath starts and the difficulty breathing, the anxiety can be almost overwhelming. And I, I can't imagine being a senior citizen, someone who's retired, maybe with some heart or lung disease or prior cancer, kidney disease, and then having COVID-19 and having no treatment. Mm. So we, uh, we only have a, another couple minutes for this segment. So I want to give you, uh, Dr. Johnson, a, a minute and then Dr. McCullough another, another minute to kind of sum up what you want the audience to take away today. Dr. Well, I think the main thing is, is, yes, there is an early effective treatment. And Dr. McCullough and American Association of Physicians and Surgeons have put out that information for you uh, to encourage your doctor to read it, uh, understand it. It's well supported in the literature. Uh, my experience is, is that patients respond well. I mean, I've treated over 100 patients. None of them have been hospitalized. They all get better four to five days. Few of them have respiratory problems that then you have to treat with steroids and may linger on. Uh, but the response is, is good. And we need early treatment to reduce the hospitalizations and reduce death. It's the only thing, disease that I've ever seen medicine not treat early, mm. which Dr. is yeah. just atrocious. Dr. McCullough, final thoughts. Yeah, the only patients who are really getting hospitalized uh, today are those who receive no treatment. So the point is high risk over age 50, additional medical problems under age 50 with serious medical disorders should get early treatment. There is a supplement or nutraceutical bundle. You've mentioned that, zinc, vitamin D, vitamin C, quercetin, lysine, and then prescription medications, uh, anti-infectives, and the, the names that, that individuals should know are hydroxychloroquine, uh, uh, ivermectin, doxycycline, azithromycin, probably two of those in that category. If five days into it or lung symptoms develop, then steroids, they can be inhaled, budesonide or oral prednisone or dexamethasone. And for individuals who are older with heart or lung problems, the importance of blood thinners. We do use a, a full dose aspirin, 325 milligrams a day, and have a low threshold to use Lovenox injections or oral anticoagulants like we would in heart conditions to prevent uh, terrible complications, which include stroke and blood clots that develop in the lungs. Wow. We're going to end with uh, a couple of websites. First, Dr. Johnson's website, uh, johnsonmedicalassociates.com is his website. Feel free to get in touch with him if you have any questions or concerns. And then finally, a, a great resource that I think all can benefit from. It's aapsonline.org. What does that stand for? Association of American Physicians and Surgeons. Outstanding. There's some great resources there. Uh, gentlemen, thank you both for coming on the show and, and really helping uh, demystify this. Thank you. Thank you. You so bet. Perfectly. That's it for now. We'll see you next time.